something a bit different from now. So it's an incredible honor to be here. So thank you so much. Get the opportunity uh, to meet with you all and to learn much more about the association, this association, um, and this approach to intervention, which I've uh, already, already learned a lot, actually, just from discussing things with people. Very relevant to the work that we're doing more broadly in interventions, so I'll take that back with me. So, but what I would like to talk about today is something slightly different. I want to address probably the, one of the foundational questions in psychology, and that is, um, can early experiences shape the sorts of person we turn out to be? And I'm going to operationalize that um, in terms of extremes, both in terms of extremes of experience, but also in terms of extremes of outcomes, developmental outcomes. And so the question that I'm going to frame is, can early adversity have sufficient power to cause neurodevelopmental problems? And in doing that, of course, uh, not only addressing this foundational question, but also challenging many of the, potentially challenging many of the assumptions uh, about the causes of neurodevelopmental uh, conditions. So to do this, what I want to do is I want to take you back, those of you who can go back, because some might not have been around to go back to, the early 1990s, when the true horror of Ceausescu's um, children's homes became apparent to the world, when the BBC uh, went into those homes after the fall of his regime and broadcast the circumstances and the conditions around the world. Now, many people were very upset, and for people of a certain age, that is my age, uh, everybody remembers those television images of the, at the time and how much it affected them. The pictures of the uh, you know, emaciated and filthy children staring back into the camera with a sort of empty blank expression really touched people around the world. But um, some people did more than be upset. There are always some people who do more than be upset. And these courageous and uh, uh, charitable uh, souls went over to Romania uh, to rescue the children uh, and to bring them home and adopt them. So um, at this point, so many of them were from the UK, and at this point we had a, a group of children coming out of these hell holes into families in the UK, and the government were thinking, what are the clinical needs of these, of these children? So at that point, they decided to contact my uh, mentor, uh, the famous Sir Michael Rutter, um, who um, initiated the English and Romanian adoptee study to explore the clinical needs, but also to explore one of his abiding interests, which of course you probably know is the effect of deprivation on people's development. He saw the opportunity to do some great science as well as some great humanitarian work, which is a combination. And of course, Michael sadly passed uh, last year, um, and um, that combination of clinical brilliance and scientific brilliance is, was... Uh, um, remembered at a, a meeting we had a, a few weeks ago, actually, in London. So I'm calling it the neurodevelopment impact of um, extreme neglect in, in early childhood. And I hope, I mean, it, I'm not a clinician, I'm a scientist. Only, I say only a scientist, I'm just a scientist. Um, and this is a little bit drier than some of the very beautiful talks we've had today. But I hope it will stimulate people to think and maybe challenge some of their preconceptions. And hopefully we'll be able to have a discussion <laughs> About the, about the causes and the consequences of this extreme uh, deprivation. Um, so the running order, I'm, first of all, I'm going to tackle the whole issue um, about the causes of neurodevelopmental problems. And in particular, I'm going to focus on ADHD. But that's really just a device, because uh, in our study, deprivation is associated with a whole range of neurodevelopmental problems. But I'm going to first of all focus on ADHD. So I'm going to talk about the issue of brain plasticity as a response to extraordinary environments. Then I'm going to explore 
why this is such a difficult question to address. And it's kind of obvious because you can't experimentally expose uh, young people to extreme adversity. Um, uh, not anymore, anyway. And, this, and, the, and, the, and the qualities of the English and Romanian ad adoptee study as what we call a natural, a unique natural experiment. Um, then we're going to move on to look at the impact of deprivation on brain structure in the study. We're going to look at ADHD as a core clinical feature of this group of institutionally deprived young people oh, and uh, growing people. So, of course, 1990 is quite a long time ago, and uh, the young people in the study are now in the mid-30s. So, um, if I slip into calling them children, do forgive me, because they're not children anymore, of course. And then I'm going to tackle this very tricky problem that has um, hardly ever been achieved, and that is to show that the clinical outcomes of early adversity are actually mediated by changes in the brain. Um, very often people have shown links to brain changes, they've shown links to clinical outcomes, but they've never really shown that, that the effects are mediated by deep-seated effects on, on, on brain structure. So we're gonna talk about that. Then I'm going to broaden the picture and from ADHD to other uh, uh, correlates in this group of young people, patterns of impairment, and then I'm going to focus on uh, what I call the sting in the tail, which kind of gives it away, um, in terms of broader pattern of mental health problems, so anxiety and depression. Um, and that's really important for a number of reasons, because, um, of course, when Michael set up the study, I, ca I got involved with the study in about 2005, so when Michael set, set up the study, what he did expect to see was trauma-type uh, effects, emotional, behavioral, maladjustment. He didn't see any of that at all in expressing these young people. He saw things he wasn't expecting. And so it's a very, very good um, reminder to scientists to not get too focused on what you expect to find, but actually be open to respond to your data. Come on. Oh. Ah, got it. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, so here are some of, I've got some disclosures. Uh, I'm trying to, I've, have we, I've done quite a lot of work with pharmaceutical companies in the past in my ADHD area, um, but uh, I'm kind of weaning myself off that, um, as you can see. But lots of other funding, uh, funding uh, disclosures. So, okay, this concept of extraordinary, uh, extraordinary environments and extreme plasticity uh, and its potential role in the causes of ADHD. So, of course, we, what we do know is that ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, runs in families. Now, trying to understand what the significance of that is very complicated, obviously, particularly within biological families. Uh, because, of course, families not only pass on genes, uh, they also create environments. And we also know that ADHD is correlated both with environmental uh, exposures, complex pattern uh, of correlated features around um, social class, family uh, functioning, uh, and so forth and so on. And ADHD kind of sits at the heart of one cluster of those things. But it also, we know, of course, it correlates with genetic variants or risk variants. Um, and in recent studies, what we found uh, is that if you look across the whole genome, uh, we have identified now 26 genetic loci, or loci, um, that are correlated at greater than chance with ADHD. So they clearly correlate with both environmental and genetic features within biological families. However, of course, twin studies provide a great way uh, to segregate the, gene the genetic, uh, shared genetic effects, common genetic effects, from shared environmental and non-shared environmental effects. And what they tend to suggest seems to solve the problem. ADHD, and some people even call it, it's a genetic disorder. So why am I going on about the environment? Well, uh, so about 
of, of uh, ADHD is a, a variance in ADHD is accounted for uh, shared genetic effects within twin models. N roughly 0% is accounted for by shared environmental effects within those models. However, those estimates depend, of course, on the nature of the populations you're working within. And so we can probably say that within ordinary populations, or populations exposed to an ordinary range of different uh, uh, exposures, environmental exposures, environments probably play a marginal and idiosyncratic role in ADHD. However, that doesn't rule out a major role for extraordinary rearing environments, such as institutional deprivation. That's because, of course, these estimates depend completely on the range of environmental exposures. And within large twin samples, the range of extraordinary, the, 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 the proportion of extraordinary environments is very, very small and is totally overwhelmed by the, the broader pattern of exposures. So, how plausible is it that these extraordinary environments uh, could create risk for something as deep-seated as ADHD or any other neurodevelopmental problem? One candidate, of course, is brain plasticity and the way the brain responds to environmental exposures during sensitive and critical periods of development. Now, of course, under normal circumstances, plasticity is essential for the regulation of genetic processes and the moulding of brain response during learning and development. That's essential. That's one notion of plasticity. But that raises the question, could extraordinary environments produce such extreme plasticity or um, uh, exploit extreme plasticity to override these genetic risks under certain situations. And in a sense, that's uh, the whole scientific question, the heart of the Romanian study. Can extraordinary adverse environments do such bad that they derail development in an otherwise genetically, inverted commas, strong brain? Or can they do such good that they can put uh, a uh, development back on track in a genetically at-risk brain. So what do we know about, about that from the literature? What, are the, what is the literature on the impact of extreme or e extreme adversity, in form of, say, for instance, maltreatment, on brain development? So there's a range of really good meta-analyses looking at this. So we know, for instance, that maltreatment is related to reduced uh, brain volumes, both grey and white matter. We know that there's associated cortical thinning in some key functional areas of the brain associated with maltreatment. We know that there's alterations, particularly within the limbic system, in terms of structure, the amygdala, and the extended uh, uh, limbic system. And we know there's some evidence, although it's a little bit unclear, of reduced uh, microstructural integrity of white matter tracts uh, in terms of connectivity within the brain. However, how, how should we interpret this data? Obviously, it's, this data comes essentially from observational studies. And it relies on, retros very often relies on retrospective reports of exposures. There's often selection by outcome, so people tend to oversample uh, populations with difficulties. And of course, the biggest problem is the familial confounding between the exposure the maltreatment exposure, and uh, brain structure. So that genes and environments are always correlated in most of these studies. 
So we have to be, we have to, as if say, we say, take it with a pinch of salt, I would say, uh, and look at some of these caveats a bit more closely. So the question becomes, why is maltreatment and brain uh, structure or pr brain function correlated? And of course, it's correlated, as I say, by this shared familial basis to these two things, which of course brings in the complication of genetic factors. And it could be that genes are mediating the effects on brain development, but they're also uh, mediating the effects on the environment. So these uh, familial patterns uh, are reflected both in the environment and in the transmitted uh, genes creating this false correlation, false association. Rarely discussed uh, in detail in many of the papers because it's hard to get around this uh, difficulty. But this means, of course, that maltreatment could actually be shaping the brain, uh, but it could also be just a correlated feature of genetic effects. How do we disentangle that? Well, of course, the question is, are there situations where this familial confound is removed. And of course, one of those situations is um, extraordinary non-familial environments. For instance, institutional deprivation. So where the exposure is uh, associated with factors that are unlikely to be correlated with those family genetic factors. So this is highlights how powerful this, uh, the English Romania adoptee study could be, has the potential to be, in trying to address this fundamental question. It's not perfect, but I think it, it takes us quite a long way in addressing some of these problems. And could these alterations, uh, if they occur, associated with deprivation, drive, be powerful enough to drive the emergence of ADHD, or autism, or other neurodevelopmental problems? So, the English Romanian adoptee study, and one of the, um, one of the, um, uh, uh, the, the inspiration that Mike had when he was designing this um, was to uh, think how to uh, develop a, 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 a model where you could associate the degree of deprivation with the level of impairment. And I'll, I'll explore that with you in a minute. In terms of the conditions in the orphanages, many of you be familiar, we, we call it gl uh, or global deprivation. Um, and this is, uh, means it's extraordinarily severe and, and, and wide reaching in its effects, but also quite challenging in terms of disentangling the, the element that's crucial. So clearly severely restricted diets, and you'll see the effect of that in a minute. High rates of communicable diseases, and, and it's important to remember that actually we're talking about probably the more resilient uh, children here because they survived. Uh, the levels of mortality were really high, particularly in uh, some of the institutions, you know, where they had a con like an epidemic of a, con um, a contagious disease. Uh, flu, for instance, I think went through a number of the institutions. Almost no social and cognitive stimulation. So many of them were consigned to cots all day um, and had no toys uh, and no chance to play. And crucially, from an attachment point of view, no personalized care, almost no personalized care. So no chance to develop uh, attachment type relationships with carers, with adults. So they kind of lacked um, all those childhood experiences that we assume to be required for normal uh, social and cognitive development. So how did uh, this actually impact their development? Let's, let's see. So these are the, there's Sir Michael in the middle. These are the colleagues uh, who were particularly involved in the brain imaging in study at King's, but as you can see, we have a, a very large team of, of people, and over the years, a really enormous team of people. So, um, as I've said, this is, uh, is based on the adoption of these profoundly deprived infants from the Romanian orphanages. Um, 
and they were exposed from between one to 43 months. So Mike um, stratified the selection by the degree of, the, by the duration of deprivation. So there are equal numbers within one to six months, six to 24 months, and 24 to 43 months. So some of these people were in those, in those cots for 43 months. And this was the first 43 months of their lives. So they typically entered the institutions in the first month or two of life. So that's really important because they, were, they weren't placed in the institutions because of any neurodevelopmental problems that were obvious. They were placed in the institutions because of poverty, essentially. And it's important to keep that in mind. And then, of course, they were adopted, and they've spent well over 20, nearly 30 years in these, uh, what you might go call enriched environments. And, of course, this gives, a gives us a radical and precisely timed change from deprivation of an extreme kind to a truly enriched environment. And our, our, hello, our families uh, in the study really w very you know, impressive families, very committed, very loving families, and still support their children as adults in many cases. <laughs> Maybe we all actually do that. <laughs> yeah. So the 165 in the study, and they were selected from 324 that entered between uh, February 90 and 92. Um, and we have 52 UK adoptees as our control group. Now this was important because the control group's crucial, obviously, in this study. I mean, you could argue that the low deprivation young people are a kind of a control group. But the non-deprived UK adoptees, Mike selected them because he called them an optimal adoptive group. So he's controlling for adoption, essentially. He could have decided, he could have tried to control for other things, but given that he didn't know what the outcomes were going to be, it was quite difficult to, to base it on clinical controls because he didn't know what the pattern would be. The, the institutions were in such chaos, and the country was in such chaos, identifying a, a, a control group of Romanian non institutionalized kids was impossible practically at the time. So, you know, it's science within a set of uh, constraints. And they've been followed up at the age of 4, 6, 11 and 15 and now into young adulthood. And I was just uh, saying that we are going to, um, we're going to do a kind of a, a mid-adult follow-up over the next uh, few years. Crucially, that this duration of deprivation is almost certainly not confounded with genetic or other risks. Um, because that's an obvious issue. Is it the case that those longer in the institutions are somehow more at genetic risk? Or somehow more at prenatal ex risk of pre negative, uh, uh, toxic prenatal exposures, uh, drugs, alcohol, or whatever? But it's very hard to figure out how that would be the case. Um, either in terms of selection into the institutions or selection out of the institutions. But even more important than that, when you look at the polygenic risk scores, um, which is the uh, genetic risk calculated across the whole genome for these young people, we see that there's no correlation with the duration of deprivation, either in terms of brain volumes. In fact, those uh, uh, later on had higher brain volumes, interestingly, were adopted later on, had higher brain volumes, or in terms of, for instance, ADHD. These lines are particularly, almost completely flat. So we're fairly confident that this uh, isn't a proxy for another pattern of risks that's kind of spuriously uh, related to uh, these outcomes. Okay, so what about the effects on brain structure? Well, we sort of had a, a big clue that we would find uh, some strong effects in terms of brain uh, structure, at least overall volume, brain overall volume, because we've monitored head circumference over time from when they actually arrived in the UK, these young people. And um, what we can see, so here you see um, the period of deprivation and then the period of um, uh, adoption up to 25 years. So these were the head circumferences at the point at which 
they entered the UK. And this axis, oh, I'm not pointing out, it's not helping you, is it? The axis, which is on this side, on you, it's on the, the other side, on this side, those aren't point one of a standard deviation. They are full standard deviations. So you can estimate that the mean head circumference was uh, uh, stunted uh, by nearly uh, over three standard deviations, uh, which is an enormous impact, uh, highlighting uh, the level of deprivation. And not only nutritional, but actually also in terms of environmental stimulation. And then what happens as we measure head circumference, as we see them uh, develop in the adoptive homes? So you can see already, so there's a devastating impact, but actually a, quite a striking pattern of recovery. So this was when we measured uh, the four and the six-year-old follow-ups. Then at the 11 and the 15-year-old follow-ups. And then in young adulthood. So you can see that there was considerable recovery. And that wasn't just restricted um, to that rather striking pattern of catch-up just during those first two or three years of post-adoption, but actually right the way through, quite a strong pattern through to adulthood, which is, I think, really striking. And one of the clearest illustrations of brain plasticity in a clinical way, both in terms of the negative impact of environments, but also the positive impacts, the double-edged nature uh, of this sword of, uh, of, the, of environmental influence on brain structure, at least at head circumference. So what of the brain imaging data? So we, we found basically the same thing, uh, which was uh, really striking. Um, but just to illustrate here the relationship, first of all, between the UK and the Romanians. Oh, can you see that if I do that? Oh, yeah, you can. Great. Um, you can see here is the UK. This is the, the mean total brain volume. Uh, here is the uh, Romanian deprived kids. And a large effect. We're talking, this is adult kids, sorry, yeah, young adults. Um, so after 22 uh, to 25 years in enriching adoptive homes, the effects uh, of deprivation are still quite clearly manifest, at least at the brain level. Despite assumed catch-up that we've seen with head circumference. Now, crucially, there's a strong dose relationship with the degree of deprivation. Um, which really highlights the causal role of deprivation in uh, determining brain, uh, brain uh, volumes, we think. And these effects were for both white and, and grey matter, so equal, equal effects. So that's at the kind of gross level. What about the more subtle regional variations? Oh, so very importantly, sorry, I forgot this. So that these effects remained significant after controlling for a whole range of potential confounds, including birth weight, interesting, subnutrition levels, height, also interesting. So they actually the relationship between height and, and, and brain volume was very small, actually, interesting. And, uh, so, and genetic risk for having a smaller head. Uh, so that's an important uh, thing to note. What about these more subtle effects? Now, we expect, uh, expected a wide range of, of, of more subtle localized effects. And this affects after controlling for total brain volume. So we found three in total, three effects, uh, regional effects. So over and above the total brain volume stunting, there was reduced effects within this crucial inferior frontal region, which is crucial, as we know, for executive control, inhibitory control. And then two rather interesting findings. So within the inferior uh, temporal region, that is implicated in a range of perceptual processes, face processing, for instance, we found relative sparing of this region in the more deprived individuals. And similarly, we found, again, relative sparing. So it wasn't that these areas were larger, but taking into account total brain volume, they were larger than they, we'd expect them to be. 
in this orbito medial orbitofrontal region, which of course we know is implicated in reward processing. Um, so these are, we thought these were really important, potentially functionally, and actually they map onto some of the clinical and the neuropsychological effects that we'll talk about. And it also raised the question for us whether these second two could in some way be compensatory approaches uh, or effects that were happening during development, or, or were they more like um, uh, uh, markers of protective, a protective factor? So that raised an interesting hypothesis for us about the impact or about the role of these two processes. Crucially, the area that everybody focuses on with maltreatment, of course, is the limbic system. Uh, however, the data isn't as clear as people make out, but still we did predict that we would see relatively larger amygdala with de in the deprived groups, as it goes along with, uh, with the literature. We didn't see anything in terms of uh, any of these uh, limbic uh, regions, either in terms of hippocampal volumes, uh, amygdala volumes, corpus callosal volumes, no effects whatsoever of deprivation. So this was a conundrum uh, for us. Particularly as we had published a pilot study about 10 years ago where we did find an effect. So the moral there for us was don't publish pilot studies because they're potentially, and it's a very highly cited study, this pilot study. They only have 15 people in each group, but because it was so rare, and probably because it went with the grain of what everybody expected, everybody cites it, but it's actually incredibly misleading because the effects aren't there when you do a proper, better powered study. Um, reproducibility uh, difficulties. Okay, so that's the brain. That's what, well, at least one part of the brain. Obviously, we've looked at other aspects, but just to keep the story simpler, uh, simple, we'll focus on the brain structure. Um, so what about ADHD? As I said before, there was no reason to predict that ADHD would be a clinical outcome uh, in this group of uh, institutionally deprived individuals. Focus being much more uh, on those emotional uh, and behavioral uh, patterns of maladaptation. However, it's one of the core features in this group. So this is a paper we... Actually, a really good overview of, of these developmental patterns is a paper we published in The Lancet in 2017, which if you're interested, I would definitely recommend having a, a quick butchers, a quick look at. Yeah. Um, and so here's the three groups, and we, it's very typical of our studies. We have a UK group, which is our UK adoptees, non-deprived, all adopted before six months. And then we have the two Romanian groups. Here's the under six month group. So these are the group that only got six months or less of deprivation. And here's the over six months group. And now we divide, uh, illustrate it in this way because what we found was that while in, with most outcomes, the under six months group looked almost identical to our non-deprived kids. Really incredibly striking. Whereas the, in the over six months group, additional deprivation didn't, have, didn't add to any additional negative effect. So it was almost like a threshold model, a step model. It was a step increase in risk that didn't really increase uh, any further up to 43 months. Very, very strange and striking pattern. One of the many, many strange and striking patterns in the data that have made people rethink a lot of their assumptions. So, so those are the effects, sorry, you, as you can tell, what I didn't say is the red line, the deprived over six months group, you can see have highly elevated levels of ADHD so, or symptoms of inattention and hyperactivity. Those are on the Rutter scale and the SDQ, people are familiar with those scales. So it's not a, not a, it's not a, a diagnostic measure, but it's, it's a good screening tool. When you do a diagnosis, the effects are even more striking in terms of ADHD. Um, and so what we found in adulthood was this pattern. And here's the percentage of cases in the, uh, in the uh, relative groups. And you can see here that uh, in terms of any presentation of ADHD, because of course you can have an inattentive presentation or a combined hyperactive, impulsive, and inattentive presentation, you can see that about 35% uh, of our young people 
uh, in the over six months group met the diagnostic criteria for ADHD. So there's a full diagnosis of ADHD, extraordinary level of ADHD. And, and the other groups being very similar and exactly what you'd expect from the epidemiological literature around about five, three to five percent, really highlighting the clinical significance of these effects. Crucially, in a the inattentive presentation is really important here. Uh, and this is a kind of central feature. So that's very common. So it's, it isn't uh, your classical combined type. It's very much an inattentive type of presentation. Now, if you compare the diagnostic levels with 15, is even more striking. So what we see, of course, at 15 is about a, f a, a, a fourfold increase in risk for ADHD in the, the high-risk group. This is this green group compared with this group. By the time they get to adulthood, it's a nearly eight-fold risk increase associated with deprivation. Now, this, this is very non-typical for ADHD, because typically with ADHD, the risk drops as the children get older. We're finding this very persistent variant of ADHD in our deprived kids, which is, a, or I think, a fascinating finding scientifically, highlighting the persistence of non Verticomas non-genetic variants, if you like, um, but also clinically. If you've got kids who've suffered deprivation, maltreatment, and have uh, ADHD, uh, then they're probably going to persist. In terms of the psychosocial functioning of the group, you can see here some very clear effects. Very high levels of unemployment. And don't forget, these are adopted into high... Uh, socioeconomic families, which I didn't mention. Most of the families are very, what we say in England, well-to-do. Many of the siblings are doctors, solicitors, and so forth. We have 80% uh, unemployment. Um, and equivalent, uh, equivalent levels of school failure, essentially. Um, interesting, there's some areas that aren't so uh, badly affected. Um, um, but, so for instance, a smaller proportion were actually living uh, at home than in the other two groups, which is kind of interesting. Uh, whether they've just, it, relationships have broken down to some extent, perhaps that's the explanation there. The other in interesting question from the adolescent to the adult is, are these really new cases? Uh, have we seen the emergence of, you know, de novo ADHD in adulthood in this you know, look, you know, 15 percent of cases, and the answer is probably not. So here is the Rutter scores from age six to 15 in the three of the persisters, those who had ADHD at adolescence and adulthood, and you can see they're very elevated right the way from age six. The new cases are actually elevated compared with the never ADHD cases. So that suggests that there was already a risk. For ADHD, even in those new cases. So it wasn't de novo ADHD, but it was kind of a, an acceleration or exacerbation of an underlying risk in that transition to adulthood. Another big difference from normal, uh, in idiop I call it idiopathic ADHD, is um, the um, sex ratio. Because as you're probably aware, that males are much more commonly affected by ADHD than females. Um, in this uh, in our sample, of course, uh, it's about 50-50. So that's kind of interesting, suggesting um, that uh, the sex-specific effects are rather different in, uh, in, this, in this deprivation related ADHD than from uh, genetic related ADHD. Okay, so we've got the brain effects, we've got the ADHD related effects, and are these effects related and the answer is, if you run mediation or models, the answer is, yes, they are related. So, for instance, the pathway between deprivation and ADHD is partially mediated by total brain volume in these statistical models, which is, I think, really a striking finding. But also, the relationship between deprivation and IQ, which I haven't talked about yet, is actually fully mediated by total brain volume, which is really striking. So, deprivation is affecting brain development, which is then having functional consequences for the child, highlighting uh, the 
role of these deep-seated changes in these young, young people. What about the hypothesis that some of these relative sparing of these particular areas are, are um, compensatory in nature? So, for instance, the relationship between deprivation and ADHD is mediated in a complicated way by effects in the inferior temporal uh, lobe. So that those deprived individuals with relatively spared inferior temporal gyrus uh, volumes had lower ADHD symptoms. So it, there is a, it does seem to suggest that this is possibly evidence for either a compensatory effect through development or somehow an underlying um, marker of resilience in some of those young people. Okay, so co-occurring problems. So the, 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 the pattern of, of effects is, um, is much broader than ADHD. ADHD is common, but it's not the whole picture. And what we find is this um, rather distinctive and quite heterogeneous pattern of uh, underlying neurodevelopmental effects. So for instance, here in this table, you can see five other uh, characteristics of the individual. DSE, now that's disinhibited social engagement. Disinhibited social engagement is a very characteristic pattern within these young people. And this is an inappropriate level of friendliness uh, and uh, a failure to recognize both appropriate levels of social space, uh, appropriate comments, uh, but also recognize the fear of strangers, the danger that comes from strangers. And you can see that uh, ADHD, is ADHD in our group is associated with this pattern as well. It's also associated oops, with quasi-autism. I'll talk about that very quickly. It's uh, not associated with conduct disorder. So we, we don't see elevated levels of conduct problems in our children at all. And that's very strange. Because ADHD, is, as you probably know clinically, is nearly always associated with elevated levels of antisocial uh, behavior. How am I doing for time? Ten, beautiful, thank you. Am I over time? Oh, am I? Oh, sorry. Am I 10 minutes over time? Oh, right. I thought I had 10 minutes to go. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm so sorry. Um, okay. Um, what's the most important bit? Uh, can I have three minutes to finish off? Oh, I'm really sorry. I apologize. Okay. And then what, the other thing that's very interesting here is that elevated levels of callous and emotional traits. So psychopathy is elevated in, a, in these children with ADHD who have suffered deprivation. Okay. I'm going to go very quickly on to the sting in the tail, because it's really important clinically. So as I said, very surprising, in childhood, at 4, at 11, and at 15, very little evidence of either emotional problems or behavioral conduct problems. I'll go through it. But what do we find uh, in this transition from adolescence to adulthood? And it, a massive escalation in depression and anxiety. Um, this is just the uh, Rutter scales. This is rated by self-report and also parent report. So it's not just the parents seen it, it's clear. And you can see, of course, there was an increase between this, these periods in self-report generally, but it was much, much greater in the deprived kids. Why is that the case? Last slide. Sorry. Um, here's a path model. Uh, that explains, I think, rather nicely this cascade of effects, which could be related, actually, to any... It, it, I don't think it's specific to deprivation. So we looked at deprivation in terms of the duration of deprivation. We looked at the role of neurodevelopmental problems in terms of a combination of ADHD, autism, disinhibited social engagement. So we took a kind of latent factor of these things. And what we found was there was a pathway from deprivation to neurodevelopmental problems. We already know that because we've shown that these things are related to deprivation. No pathway direct from deprivation to emotional problems. There was no direct effect. There was no sleeper effect in that sense. 
Everything went through neurodevelopmental problems. And then from there, there were two pathways. And this is important clinically, I think. One of the pathways went directly from neurodevelopmental problems to emotional problems. So having ADHD, having autism, um, seemed to directly affect levels of de depression and anxiety uh, when you were an adult over that period. But also there were mediated pathways, not surprisingly, through unemployment. If you have neurodevelopmental problems, you're much more likely to be unemployed, you're much more likely to be depressed and anxious. But also psychological pathway, going through difficulties establishing friendships. We've just published another paper on bullying. So within this group, so bullying becomes a very important factor within this model. So the young people with neurodevelopmental problems, much more likely to be bullied, and are much more likely to develop mental health problems. So, so I'm really sorry I went, I didn't realize I was taking so long, I apologize. Um, yeah, so the overall story I think is that um, uh, our study provides some of the strongest evidence for the power of uh, early exposures within critical periods up to this three and a half years to uh, impact brain development in a way that persists even after the most expensive intervention you could imagine which is 25 years of intensive, love-filled family life. And those effects uh, mediate a whole range of clinical effects. Now, we've got time for questions afterwards, haven't we? So please think of questions, because there must be loads, given that I haven't even finished the talk yet. <laughs> so thanks very much.